this. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's right. So um, I've been telling this story, true story, for 35 years. When I was in rabbinical school in my freshman year, uh, first year at, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, we decided to go to Greece for our spring break. And uh, we got to the island of Santorini. Have you ever been to Santorini? Well, when you get off the boat in the harbor, the only way to get up this very, very steep cliff at the time was to rent a donkey to take you up the, the cliff with your, at that time, backpack and, and so on. So my friend and I uh, approached the donkey driver, <laughs> who was a 100-year-old man. And I'm not kidding. He truly was 100 years old. Um, he looked even older. And uh, we paid him the drachma that we were coming in. We, were paying, we paid him the drachma that we were supposed to pay him. It was drachma back then. And come on in, guys. And um, we were mortified to find out that it wasn't that he was renting us the donkeys and we were going to ride them up and give them, you know, but that us 20-year-olds, the two 20-year-olds, were going to ride the donkey while the 100-year-old man walked up the cliff right beside us, okay? And as he was walking up with the donkeys, he was saying in Greek to the donkeys, every day, every day. And my friend and I were hearing him saying, uh, we don't speak Greek, but in our mind, he was saying, every day I walk up the hill, every day I walk down the hill, every day, every day. Well, it turns out that my, Wendy and I both had had similar experiences, and we both had wanted to get back to Santorini. And this past week after the, after the Israel trip, we left the group, and we didn't leave them. They went home, and we decided to go to the Greek islands and see Santorini again, and see how, how it met our memories. And little. Believe it or not, the same 100-year-old man was there with the donkeys. No. Well, it was probably a different man, but and and, none, and he was saying, you know, every day. And, I'm, and <laughs> so finally, I went up to him and I said, "What? What are you? What does every day mean?" He says, "No, no, it's not every day. It's adivre, which sounded to us." And so I said, "What does that mean?" And you could guess, adivre in Greek means go, move, you know, andale, andale, yalla, yalla, go, 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 go. But for us, it's always been every day I walk up the mountain, <laughs> every day I walk down the mountain. And it so happens that as this was actually happening, as this last week when we were in Santorini and reliving this experience, uh, what was on my mind was what I was going to teach all of you about what is practical Kabbalah, right? And um, it seemed like it was fitting because I realized that my study of Kabbalah, which I, I admit is very academic, um, is also very esoteric. There is really nothing in my study of Kabbalah that one can use every day. And so the, what I began thinking of on that donkey walking, you know, climbing up the mountain was, actually, I have to be honest with you, this time I took the new cable car. But OK, but, it, <laughs> but spiritually, I was on the donkey walking, you know, having, walking up the mountain. And, um, I was thinking, how can I turn my very academic, very esoteric study of, uh, of Kabbalah into something that you could use every day as you walk up the mountain of life and every day as you walk down the mountain of life? And that's what we're going to try to do for the next, uh, well, 90 minutes or so, OK? To understand. And I have to admit that part of my problem walking up with the donkey was that, that I knew that I had gotten you all here on false pretenses. Uh, I've, I've taught Kabbalah many times, and we usually get fairly large classes. And this, like this one, we had about 50 people registered. I even had one, we had 400 people show up. Um, it's a pretty popular co uh, uh, topic. And um, what's funny about that is that the Kabbalists did not care at all about teaching you all how to live every day. That was the last thing on their mind. The last thing on their mind was whether you were happy or fulfilled, or now they were rabbis. So in their rabbinic life, they they did care about those things, I'm sure. But in their kabbalistic life, that was those were not the questions that they were asking. What's ironic about this is that um, there is a study in Judaism, a field which does care deeply about what you do and how you feel, and the kind of life you live. It's called Musar, 
right? And, and, and when I say it's ironic, it's because when Rabbi Bennett and, and Julie August teach our Musar classes, which really are about relevancy, about how do we get better, do better, be better, feel better, we get four people, five people, <laughs> six people showing up. And so one of the reasons I wanted to teach practical Kabbalah is to trick you into coming here tonight so I can advertise the fact that on June 2nd and 9th, um, Rabbi Bennett will be teaching a, cl a cl class in Musar. And I hope you'll all uh, come to that because Musar really does want to tell you how to live a better life. Kabbalah doesn't give a damn. <laughs> OK? Now, so the question is, but, uh, but I, because I made the promise, I do think I've been able to distill three or four messages from Kabbalah, maybe even five if we, get to, if we take the two-hour course, um, that I really do think can, can uh, improve the way we live. But I just want you to understand that that was not the intention of the Kabbalists. Okay? So what was the intention? Always a good student asks a good question. <laughs> Um, some of you have taken my introduction to Kabbalah classes, and I, am, I apologize if I, if I am going to repeat some of that. I promise we'll move up beyond it um, quickly. First and foremost, the Kabbalists were rabbinic masters who knew the Torah backwards and forward, who believed that you could elevate your soul to God's presence through the Hebrew letters of the Torah. So we're going to take a look at a text uh, right now. Norman, since you were brave enough to ask the first question, we're going to skip a little bit um, to page three. And Norman, would you just do me a favor and, and just read at the top there, Sefer Yitzhara? Sefer Yitzhara means the book of creation. And as you'll hear, the Kabbalists were obsessed with creation, with, with Breshit, OK? So it's not surprising that one of their primary uh, books will be called Sefer Yitzhira, the book of creation. So Norm, go ahead. 22 letters on the foundation of creation. No, which 22 letters do you think those might be? The Hebrew alphabet. The Hebrew alphabet. Good. OK, keep going. God engraved them, hewed them out, combined them, weighed them, and set them at opposites. And God formed them, and God formed through them everything that is formed and everything that is destined. So what is Sefer Yitzhara saying here about the, world, about the way the world is, is built? By the way, it's the same thing that modern scientists say, just with slightly different language. It's about chemistry? It's, well, even deeper than chemistry. What underlies everything? Oh. These little component parts, right? And in, in modern science, we would call those little component parts yeah. atoms, yeah. right? They had, the same, they had an atomic theory also, the Kabbalists, except that the the atoms were not made up of electrons and so on. They were made up of the 22 Hebrew letters of the Torah. Now, I think it, I, we're going to talk a lot about the fact that Kabbalists and scientists have a lot in common. Because my second definition of, of who the Kabbalists were is that the Kabbalists were the spiritual physicists of the universe. That's what they were really all about. More than how to live a good life or, 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 or be a... a you know, or be a California uh, movie star. Uh, what they were really, what they were really worried about is how was the world created, and what is it made of, and how does God fit into all of that? Okay, so they had this atomic theory, and it's amazing that the. And one of the things I'm going to brag about is the Kabbalists often got the right answers. They use slightly different language, but they often got the right scientific answers. So, for instance, you're talking, you know, 800 years ago. How would a Kabbalist know that underlying this piece of plexiglass, they didn't have plexiglass at the time, but underlying this piece of plexiglass are little teeny pieces making it up? You, know, you understand what I'm saying? They didn't have microscopes either. Certainly not atomic microscopes. right? So um, how did they know it? But they did, somehow. I would suggest maybe they were able to elevate themselves to God's presence. Um, and they would try to elevate themselves to God's presence through the study of these Hebrew letters. Now, you notice I'm not saying Hebrew words. I'm saying Hebrew letters. Because for a Kabbalist, if you want to understand the way the universe works, yes, as a rabbi, you need to know the stories of the Torah. But as a Kabbalist rabbi, you're sort of ignoring the stories and looking for the deeper message. 
So I hope this will be a way to, I know it's getting complicated, so let me explain it in this, in this acronym. And I think this will help you. Everyone that reads the Torah would agree that there's a simple meaning to the Torah. It's called, in Hebrew, pshat. Right, actually, I, I, I was smart enough for once to actually get a board. I don't know how to use the board, but let me see if it works. OK, so, so in English, I guess you would spell it pshat, which means the simple meaning. So Abraham goes forth from the land of, of uh, uh, his birth to the land of Israel. Person A goes from point A to point B. Simple meaning. Got it? Everyone would understand it. Everyone understands the Torah on that basis. You don't have to be a chacham. To, you just read it. Right? A Kabbalist, however, would argue that in the text, there is a, something called a remez, which means a hint. A hint that there's something more going on there. OK? Just hints. Every rabbi agrees that you also, in order to understand the Torah, you also need something called drash. Now, why is that? In order to understand what, by the way, not only Kabbalists, but any rabbi of, of these eras, you would have to understand that for them, the Torah was given by God. God is perfect. And so what does that mean about the Torah? It's perfect. There can't be mistakes. There can't be contradictions. The rabbis would even argue that there can't be um, things like foreshadowing or, um, or repetition. That it is the way it happened exactly the way it's written. Geshribben, right? So what happens if you find something that contradicts itself within the Torah? Or a mistake? or a word that seems wrong, or a grammar, a grammar that's off, or something that repeats itself. That's called, I'm going to put that in. This is an important word to understand what the Kabbalists were doing. I'm going to write it sideways. I don't know if you can even see it, but I don't want you to get it mixed up. That's called a koshi, a difficulty. Every rabbi, Rabbi Loss, Rabbi Syme, Rabbi Fromm, Rabbi Hornson, every rabbi that you've ever heard give a sermon uses Drash. Because a drash is a story or an explanation that fills in the hole that is left by a koshi. Got it? We use the word midrash as if it's just a story, like a fable. It's not. A midrash is a story that is written to explain a problem in the Torah, a koshi in the Torah. We got it so far? We're not to the Kabbalist yet. We're to every rabbi who gives a sermon anywhere they've ever done it. Because of this remez, however, the Kabbalists have another level that the other rabbis don't go to, to which the other rabbis do not go. And that is called sod, the secret. That there is a secret built in to, because they get this hint, there's a secret built in to the formulation of the letters in, now, you know, you know a very simple version of that. You've all heard of gematria, right? So for instance, the word chai, right? Does anyone know what the gematria, the number, the numerical number uh, 18. is 18. 18? You add up the numbers, you get it. And if, if this word equals the same as this word, they make connections. That's a very simple form of what we're talking about, a code built into the Torah. But they use gematria. They use other things as well, other comparisons. So, the reason I think you'll be able to remember this is that if you take the first letters of Pshat, Remez, Drash, and Sod, you get a, a very common Hebrew word called Pardes. Right? And Pardes is what this is really all about. Pardes in Hebrew means garden. Think Garden of Eden. And it's what the goal of the, of the, of the Kabbalists is. Remember, I said that Kabbalists were rabbinic masters who used the, the letters of the, of the Torah and the study of those letters in order to elevate themselves to the pardes, to God's garden, if you will. Are we together? OK. Now, you'll notice 
that this has nothing to do with self-actualization or popular culture. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite. Because they call this thing, I'm going to write sideways again. They call this thing, does anyone know what Kabbalah means literally in Hebrew? Say it. We translate it as, good, we translate it as Jewish mysticism, which is why everybody thinks it's like all the other mysticisms, right? But Kabbalah doesn't mean mysticism at all. Kabbalah means receiving. Receiving. When you go to a uh, restaurant, we were just leading a trip to Israel, and very often I had to ask the waiter for a Kabbalah, a receipt, right? Kabbalah is a reception. If you go to the reception area in the hotel, it's a reception. Why would they call it Kabbalah? Probably, no one knows for sure, they didn't write about these things, but probably because they didn't want you knowing about it. It was something that was received and passed along from rabbinic master to rabbinic master, not, not for the populace. Okay? Well, that, okay, so then what's interesting is Kabbalah had been forgotten until the beginning of the 20th century when a great, a gr truly, and this is where my study of Kabbalah really starts and, and ends, frankly, uh, named Gershom Sholem, begins to find these ancient texts, or oh, not ancient, old texts, bring them back to life, study them in, a, in an academic fashion, and, uh, and you know, and it goes from there. We start getting translations of the Zohar, which we'll talk about in a little while. Um, and it's not really until uh, a, 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 a rabbi named Berg in L.A. starts the uh, L.A. Center, the, the Los, what's it called? The Los, Center for Kabbalah of Los Angeles, or Los Angeles Center for Kabbalah, I can't remember. Um, and what he does is he takes very simple Jewish stories and fables and, and uh, uh, midrashim, mixes them and this is where it gets very sort of painful for me as an academic, mixes them with, uh, with, with really, well, I don't want to be that condescending, with let's just say that they're Eastern European superstitions and bubble mices, <laughs> and um, begins to sell Kabbalah water for $60, and, you know, and, and little red bracelets, which have nothing to do with Kabbalah, by the way, um, for $120, and, is a, and by the way, was indicted because uh, they, they didn't write off their jet or something like that on their taxes. Um, or they tried to write it off, I can't remember, but he, he went to jail, uh, I, I believe, but he certainly was indicted. And, um, and, it be, and then Madonna and Brittany and, and the group started, started doing Kabbalah, which, you know, and suddenly that's why you're all here today. <laughs> okay? Um, so third definition of Kabbalah, or the Kabbalists, is that the Kabbalists were naughty boys trying to break into God's mansion. They were naughty boys trying to, now why do I say naughty? Does everyone got this? So I can take this off the, this, the thing here? Okay, so the reason I say naughty is that this is dangerous. You're not really supposed to be inquiring into the things the Kabbalists inquire into. So some of you may remember a Midrash, you've probably heard it, I'm sure you've heard it at Rosh Hashanah here at Temple Israel, guaranteed. There's an old Midrash. Remember, Midrash, remember Midrash, that was the third level? There's no Midrash that says, I, I can never write backwards. Let's see. You're this way. Uh, let's try this. Is this a bet for you? Yeah. Does that look like a bet? Yeah. OK, good. I'm left-handed. It makes it even more difficult. OK, so, um, so there's an old Midrash that says, why does the Torah begin with a bet instead of what an Aleph? Right? You would think it might start with an Allah. And there are lots of wonderful Midrashim about this question. Uh, one of them is, you know, that a bet looks like is, is sort of a symbol of the home, by it, and, you know, everything starts at the home. And there's all sorts of nice ones. But the, the, the best known Midrash for why the Torah does not start with an with a, a Aleph is that, see how a bet is formed? 
you are allowed to inquire about anything that happens after creation. But what happened before creation, what caused creation, forbidden. A sore. You're not allowed to go there. So where do the Kabbalists go in their inquiries? Right there. Remember I said that the Kabbalists were physicists, try, spiritual physicists trying to figure out the, the nature of the universe? So if you're a spiritual physicist, right, what do you want to know more than anything else? If you're a physicist, if you're a physicist and you got a, 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 a Albert Einstein who, who once said that his whole study was to figure out the workings of the mind of God. So if Albert Einstein got a free trip, a ticket to go up to talk to God for five minutes, what's the first question that Albert Einstein would have asked him? Creation. What, how was the world created? How did you do it? God, right? And that's exactly what the Kabbalists did. Now, the way they did it, how is a Kabbalist going to get here to this moment? Remember I said there's got to be a Koshi, right? In order to inquire into the Torah, you can't think of it. Remember I said think of this as God's mansion, right? Let's put a, <coughs> make it into a mansion. So if this is God's mansion, I, we, by the way, in my neighborhood, I don't know if it had it. We actually had an old mansion, come on in guys, we had a mansion that had been abandoned in my neighborhood and us boys were constantly trying to break into it. All the time. It, had, it was great, it had like vines on it, it was spooky, it was haunted, it was fabulous. And we were constantly trying to break into it. And um, hey guys, Hi. how are you? So, yeah, oh I'm sorry. So when we were breaking into this mansion, how do you think we got in? A window, and preferably not just a window, but if we were lucky, so we didn't get arrested, a broken window, right? So that's what the that's what the Kabbalists are trying to do. They're trying to break in to God's mansion, and they're not going to go in through the locked door, even, or certainly not through the walls, the strong part. <coughs> they're going to find the weakest place, and the weakest place would be the. Are you with me now? The biggest. Koshi. Remember that word? The bigger the Koshi, the bigger the broken window. Or the, more, bro more, or the more, bro more broken the window, perhaps, would be a better analogy. So what they would do, and one of the biggest Koshis, Koshiim, in the Torah for the rabbis occurs at this moment. And what is it? In order to explain this amazingly wide, broken window, garage door size window that they were able to drive their truck through, you have to understand that every rabbi of the time agreed on one thing. Now, I've, no one's ever said that sentence before about anything. <laughs> every rabbi agreed about one thing. But this they actually did. Every rabbi of those ages agreed, and these ages, agreed that the world was created ex nihilo. Is anyone, any Latin, any Latin speakers there? Out of nothingness. Not that there was a bunch of stuff hanging around and God put it together, but no. Suddenly, there was nothing, and then suddenly, there's a world. By the way, it wasn't just the rabbis. The Greeks believed this. The, the, uh, the Romans believed this. The Roman philosophers, this was a, a common idea of the, of the time. But the rabbis followed them. The world was created from nothingness. Here's the problem. It's in the, it's in the packet, but you just know this so well, we don't have to read it. The beginning of the Torah contradicts that idea. It says, Breshit bara Elohim et It's in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was unformed and void. And it says, and it was tohu vavohu. The wor world was tohu vavohu. We call it unformed and void. That's not what tohu vavohu really means. What tohu vavohu really means is, and the world was undifferentiated stuff. Got it? So here, all the rabbis have agreed that this is a foundational principle of Judaism, and their most sacred book in the first line says, that's not true. Now, can you understand what a giant, gaping Koshi this is? 
right? And you can also understand why the rabbis w would protect this and not want you to go there. Remember, why is the Torah started with a bet? Because you're not allowed to talk about this. You're only allowed to talk about things that go afterwards. Okay. So as it turns out, Isaac Loria, who is really the father of Kabbalah, we were, those of us who were on the Israel trip, do you remember we were sitting outside his synagogue um, uh, in Sfat, right? And what's that? Well, so this is about 500 years ago. Yeah. I will, I will argue that Kabbalah started um, our first, if we get there today, uh, I'll argue that the first Kabbalistic text is actually in the Torah, and the second one's in the Talmud. But the first really known Kabbalist is 500 years ago, Isaac Luria. Okay? He's probably the first one who, who we called a Kabbalist. Uh, again, I'm going to argue that Jacob was the first Kabbalist, but Jacob wasn't called a Kabbalist. So <clears throat> Isaac Luria, sitting in his beautiful city of Tzvat, and by the way, if you, well, some of you I know have been there because um, you went with me. But um, sitting in the beautiful city of Tzfat, you, you could, it's a kind of place where you could almost reach up and touch the stars. Top of this beautiful mountain uh, in, in the north of Israel. If there was ever a place for mystics to be, this, was, this is the, the place for them to, to hang out. And Isaac Gloria is there with his students. And he meditates on the Hebrew letters of the Torah, specifically this particular koshi. He elevates himself to God's presence. And of course, I mentioned that they are the physicists of the universe. So just like Albert Einstein would do, Isaac Gloria has the exact same question for God. God, how do you create the world? And Isaac Gloria comes down. And here we're going to finally get to our first everyday application of Kabbalah to your lives which I said, I, have, I had to pull this out of my tochest, i got to tell you, but because it's a very esoteric science. But I think this one works. Loria comes, Loria comes up with the, comes down, I should say, uh, with the following story about the creation of the world. And you've all heard this. We've talked, this is a fairly basic Kabbalistic story. I'm sure it's not new to you. Uh, Loria says that in the beginning, God was everywhere, and God wanted to create a world. What was God's problem? Where to put the world? So what does God do? God contracts himself and contracts himself and contracts himself and contracts himself into what are called kaleen. Now, in your, on the very front of your text, you'll see a, a diagram of what we call the spherot, right? Uh, the, the easy uh, explanation is spheres, spheres of God's presence. Um, the academics that I respect uh, translate spherot as emanations, God's emanations. In any case, according to Isaac Luria, God contracts himself or itself or whatever into kalim. Boy, that's a lousy looking kalim. Kalim are vessels in order to create create room for the world. It's a process, and this is really where we're going to focus at the, at the beginning of, of our talk. Uh, it's a process called tzimtzum. It's anamanopoetic. Tzimtzum. Sucking in. Right? And um, God contracts himself. I'll use him just because it's too hard to use anything. Sphere by sphere. Sphere by sphere. God contracts himself into this kaleem, these kaleem, these vessels. So one sphere, a second sphere, a third sphere. There are 10 altogether. And eventually, however, the kaleem, the vessels, are finite. And God, of course, is infinite. And so God contracts and contracts and contracts and contracts and contracts himself into these vessels. And finally, what's going to happen to the vessels? Bam! There's going to be a huge explosion, and from that explosion, the world is created. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Does this have anything to do with the scientists that are talking about black holes and, and big booms? 
Big Bangs. So you've heard this theory before because in the 1950s, a scientist, a physicist in Russia, whose name was George Gamov, studying not the Torah, but mathematics, comes up with a theory which is some people call the Big Bang Theory. What is the Big Bang Theory? The Big Bang Theory says that in the beginning, Rashid, in the beginning, time, space, and matter all contracted and contracted and contracted and contracted into a single point. And finally, the single point could not contain time, space, and matter. And there was a huge explosion. Bam! And from that explosion, the world was created. Now, one could argue that Isaac Luria just got lucky even though he was 500 years before Gamov. One could argue, eh, you know, a million chimpanzees typing on a million typewriters could write Shakespeare. <laughs> the problem with that, in my opinion, is that before you heard about the Big Bang Theory, in your m mind as a human being, what did explosions do? They destroy things. So the idea that an explosion would create is so counterintuitive that I, it's hard for me to believe that he just got lucky. Right? I, I actually, even as skeptical as I am, it makes more sense to me that he went up to God's presence and had a conversation with God than, than that he just came up with it by sheer luck. Okay? But this is not one of the lessons from Kabbalah that you're supposed to learn, but one of the lessons from Yedwab that I think is important from Kabbalah is that Good science, that good science and good religion will always agree when they have the right answer. Let me just give you a real quick, this is off the topic, but real quick. Everyone thinks science and, and uh, religion are counter to, to one another when it comes to creation, right? And we're fighting about it in the school, with school boards and everything. But if you think about it, here the Torah was written 3,000, a little more than 3,000 years ago. And at that time, you would think that the biblical author would have thought that if you see a chimpanzee, it has no relation to, to an ant, which has no relationship to a fish, which has no relationship to a human being, and so on and so forth. And yet, if you study the book of Genesis, except for the fact that it happens in seven days, if you take the day, if you figure in those days, who knows how long a day was, right? Except for that one difference, how does Dar what does Darwin say happened first? Well, first the world is created. There's you know, magma, and, the, and then there's a separation of the seas from the earth. Well, that's how the Bible has it. Right? Then, what's the first animal that's created? Little squirmy things in the ocean. By the way, what does Darwin say? Little squirmy things in the ocean. What's the second animal? Fish. Darwin, fish. Third in the Bible, right? amphibians. Third with Darwin? amphibians. Next, we get uh, uh, mammals and birds. And finally, on the last day, or next to last day in the Bible, we get human beings. With Darwin, you've seen the charts, you know, uh -huh. right? Human beings. The amazing thing is not how different those two stories are, it's how similar they are. And how did the biblical author 3,000 years ago know that? Religion and science will always agree when they have the right answer. Because truth is truth, which is, by the way, the things, one, one of the things we're going to talk about today. One of the things I, reason I study Kabbalah and not Musar is, for me, I care more about finding the truth than I do about feeling good. So for me, Kabbalah is a perfect thing to be studying. For some of you, you may be in the wrong class. You probably should go to Bennett's Musar class because you really came here to feel good. OK? Got it? OK. So in any case, so now you sort of understand uh, what, this, what the theory is. So let's talk about how it can change your lives. A professor of mine, Rabbi Borowitz, wrote an wrote a, a article many, many years ago that no one paid much attention to, and I think is one of the most brilliant pieces I've ever read. It's called Simsum as a Model of Leadership. Simsum as a model of leadership. What does Simsum mean? Remember what Simsum means? Contracting. Contracting as a model of leadership. 
And one of the things I, one of the reasons I think this is such a brilliant idea is, first of all, I'm a rabbi at Temple Israel. So we're going to talk, let me talk about it structurally in terms of organization first, and we'll get to what it might do for you as a human being uh, second. So you know most of us pretty well, Rabbi Bennett, Rabbi, you know, there's no lack of ego on our rabbinic staff. <laughs> rabbi Yedwa, Rabbi Loss, Rabbi Simon, of blessed memory, right? And yet, no rabbi has ever left Temple Israel in 70-something years of history. How does that work? Right? Because in most congregations, you have to have what they call a mara d'atra, a person who has a final word. The only way our synagogue, the reason our synagogue has 3,400 families and those other synagogues have 500 is because of tzimtzum. Right? If you need to fill every vacuum, you can't be a rabbi at Temple Israel. If you recognize a vacuum and are willing to step into it for the good of the organization, whenever it appears, you can be a rabbi at Temple Israel, as long as you're also willing to step back and not be the leader at times as well. I would argue that that's the way an organization works best. It's, by the way, no other reform, there's only one other reform synagogue in the world that believes that. Right? And that's why we have such a small movement. It's a place in Westchester. They only have two rabbis, but they're co-rabbis. So um, how does this work? My sister, uh, some of you know, is a, was an uh, engineer at Microsoft. But she was in early. Uh, she retired at the age of 40, by the way, and will never have to work again. And so did her husband, who also worked at Microsoft. And you thought I was the smart brother. OK, so uh, um, yeah, there's no question. I'm, not the, I'm the least smart person in my family. Um, and. Uh, it was fascinating because at Microsoft in those days, it might be very different now, but back in those days, it didn't matter what your level of pay or, or seniority was in terms of who would lead a particular task force. So my sister was leading the task force to teach um, Word, remember Microsoft Word, how to do grammar. Now that's, by the way, very funny because my sister is an MIT master's University of Pennsylvania uh, electrical engineer. Um, I couldn't write a, a single, single English sentence to save her life, OK? So uh, um, the fact that she was teaching, the fact that at Microsoft she was the most uh, grammatically uh, adept is pretty, pretty funny and scary. But, um, but nonetheless, she was the head of the group to teach Word how to do grammar. So when you get a grammar checker now, that's my sister, right? Wow. Um, and uh, <coughs> My sister, when she was the head of that group, had vice presidents of Microsoft working under her. Right? So um, the point is that a, a system works best without a hierarchy. And what do I mean by that? A hierarchy will kill innovation. And the reason for that is the person at the head of any hierarchy has the least to gain from change. Right? If you're at the head of a hierarchy, why would you want things to change? You're doing very nicely, thank you very much. Right? So we use, at Temple, we use what we call a round table approach, from Rabbi Later, who got here three years ago, to Rabbi Loss, who got here 40 something years ago. Um, we're sitting around a round table. We call it a competition of good ideas. Best idea wins, and you have to leave your ego at home because your idea is going to get beat up pretty badly. Jim will tell you, he's been sitting, he sat at, sat at those tables for many, many, how many years? 15 years or something? You know, he'll tell you. Um, and Jerry, too. And I think that's all, right? Linda. And Linda, and Linda. We got, oh my God, three past presidents in one room. I'm, I'm surprised this room is not exploding just like the Big Bang. Um, so yeah, so you've, you've been sitting there. You understand that it's just a competition of good ideas. That only works if you're able to do Simpson. Right? If everyone has to fill the room, there can't be a round table. Is that making sense to you? Yes. So I believe in Simpson as a model of leadership because I've lived it for the last 30 years. It sounds almost like King Arthur's concept. It is. Totally based on King Arthur, except we don't have a king. I mean, Rabbi Loss thinks he's the king, but we don't. Oh. <laughs> um, but well, he's really. Here. Actually, it's usually the cantors that really think they're the kings, but we won't tell you. So, the, uh, so in any case, the, that's what I've experienced here. We were, um, I was, we were, at, we were in uh, uh, Israel, and. Um, Wendy receives a panic call from my daughter Zoe 
that uh, who's going uh, next semester to Prague for uh, it's a nice life to be you know these anyway to go to Prague for a semester abroad, and um, she's panicked because she doesn't know how she's going to get all of her stuff from her room. She can't just hide, she can't this time this year she can't just rent a, a storage unit because it's it's going to be a whole you know nine months before she's back. How she's going to get her stuff from Columbus, uh, Ohio to to Commerce Township, Michigan. And I'm listening to my wife on the phone, and she's like, well, you know, you could do this, you could do that. And, and she's asking, and she's getting on the phone, she's like, Paul, what should, what do, 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 And she's like, you know, trying to solve this problem. From, and we're in Israel with a seven hour time difference, and, and Wendy's trying to solve Zoe's And finally I said to Wendy, Wendy, Zoe's 19 years old. We sent her to college so that when she's done, she could solve problems in her life. I think you could sort of step away from this one and she'll be fine, right? She'll send this stuff home, she'll cajole someone into driving it for her, she'll, she'll rent the truck, whatever she's gonna do. Wendy looked at me like I was the stupidest person that has ever walked <laughs> the face of the earth. And yet, in the end, we had a talk, she agreed, and you know what, Zoe's stuff, when I got home, was in my office in UPS boxes. She did just fine, right? right? Um, but the idea of symptom of pulling back from solving our children's problems, our family's problems, is a very, very, very difficult thing to do. It's just not built into the human. And, and I would say that one of the things you could learn from Kabbalah is if we're going to, going to be what the Christians call imitatio deo, if we're going to live what we call b'tselem Elohim, in the image of God, that we should probably take a hint from God's very first action, which was contraction. Now, some of you are not raising children at this point, and some of you are not leading corporations or, or, or organizations. So let me try to bring it to a point where I think, at least for me, it's the most difficult thing to learn from symptom. Some of you may know that I sometimes like to give advice. It's even worse because when someone comes to me for advice, unlike Sonia, for instance, Sonia has like hours and hours and hours, and, and Renee, I mean, you have hours and hours and hours to deal with them in therapy, right? right? And the longer, the better, because the checks keep coming in, right? So it's, uh, you know, the, more, the longer we're in therapy, the better we like it. No, not Renee, not Sonia, but other, other people maybe. So um, me, I'm a rabbi. I've got an hour. I could either solve your problem in an hour or I send you to Sonia and Renee, <laughs> someone who's actually qualified to help you with your problems. So, the, so I am trained. Right? I am not a therapist. My job is to solve people's problems in an hour. And if I can't do that, I send them to someone who can in 30 hours. Maybe 30 years. Or, or 30 years sometimes, yes. Um, so it's built in. It's built into my DNA as a Yedwab. It's built in my DNA as a rabbi. It's just built into who I am. It's built in my DNA as someone who thinks you know, he, he can analyze things fairly, fairly well. So um, I was, as you know, I took a, a, a yoga teacher training. And I'm not particularly limber. You know, it was hard to figure out how to, how to stretch. And it was other things that were difficult about it. But the hardest thing was symptom. Because in yoga, we're told that before we step into someone else's life, we should come to our breath, they call it. Just breathe through our nose, in and out, and wait. And then when you think you're about to give, it's, you're, you really know the problem, and, you, and, you, and you've analyzed it, and you can see the way you can help a person's life, instead of giving, you come to your breath. And you breathe, and you wait, and you listen. And then when you know you have the answer to the problem, you come to your breath, and you breathe, and you listen. So. I, um, I was good friends with my yogi, I guess you could call him. And uh, he had a Jewish issue. Um, and he called me to lunch and uh, told me what the problem was. And I knew the answer. I mean, I'm a rabbi, right? I mean, you know, get, bring me a Jewish problem, that's easy. Um, 
And I went to give him the answer. And this is what he did. We're sitting across from each other. This is what he did. Linda, can I take your arm here? He just went like this. Just grabbed my arm and he squeezed. I stopped. I said, but you know, and then he squeezed a little harder. <laughs> but really hard. And finally, I got it. I just stopped, came to my breath, listened, waited. And really, it wasn't really about giving him the right answer. It was actually about just letting him have a chance to talk. Simpson, contraction, right? That's really much, much more important than any answer I could give him. Because the truth was, he actually knew the right answer. That's what this was, that's, that's, it wasn't what this was all about. It was about being able to be heard. I promise you, if you will try that with your wife, your husband, your child, your friend, I promise you, directly from God, this is directly from God's first action, Simpson, that you will live, right, you will live a better, you will live a better, healthier, more successful life. By the way, just a, a little side, I always tell people I'm not going to reveal this to anyone until my final sermon, because after this, they're going to fire me. Um, but, uh, but another interesting thing about people that come to rabbis for, for advice is that they don't really want to solve, well, they, a certain proportion, do not really want to have their problem solved, right? They're coming here because you represent God, and they want God to tell them that they are right and the other schmuck is wrong. Uh. <laughs> okay? So I had, this is a true story, right before I left for Israel, I was, at, I was at services, and a friend of mine came up to me and said, Paul, look over my right shoulder. I said, okay. Yeah. You see that woman over there? I said, yeah. Said, She's one of my clients, not, not a therapist. He's in a different business altogether. It's one of my, one of my customers. I said, okay. She said, I was at her house the other day working on her or whatever it was, and uh, she said uh, she, she was complaining about you. I said, Oh, what happened? She said, well, she came to you a few months ago for some advice about her family. And she said, and these are, this is quote, quote, unquote. She said, I came to him because I wanted him to tell me what to do. And instead of telling me what I wanted to hear, he told me the truth. <laughs> Honest to God. So, um, so when I say that it's not really the advice or the answer or the, that people are asking for, I mean, here's a woman who was honest about it, right? Honest about it. And, um, and I appreciate that, right? So I, I'm sharing with you uh, with a little bit of humility, but also just saying that, you know what? All of us would be better off, all of us, all of us would be better off doing a little more Tim in our life. Questions? That's the first big, that's the first big practical Kabbalah, yeah? He says if someone uses the expression, they're listening with their third ear. Right? Good. This is the ear that, that, asks, that is trying to get the information. This is the ear that's trying to, to uh, give the advice. And there's another ear which is just listen. Right. OK? Good. Um, I, I, I forgot to mention at the beginning that pra the other ironic thing about this class is that um, practical Kabbalah is a term that's used in uh, Kabbalah. It's called. Uh, um, but it's, it's, what's funny about it is that it is, um, it is actually the opposite of what we're trying to do here today. And Isaac Luria um, was very much opposed to it. And it's partly what led to the Kabbalah Center of LA. So under Hasidism, and also other, other, even back in, in Luria's time, people began to say, well, if I can have this power of getting to God's presence, I can affect the world around me through magic, through, right? And um, Laurie himself said that this was a harmful, harmful outgrowth of, of his study and tried very hard in his own career to, to damp it down. So you all know some of so is anyone going to Eastern Europe with us? Okay, so you will um, see 
if, if you do go to Prague, for instance, some, some are going to Prague and some aren't, but if you do go to the city of Prague, for instance, uh, there was a famous rabbi called uh, Rabbi Lo, or, or the Maharal, right? Maharal was his nickname. And does anyone know the story about the Maharal? What he did, you know, there was all sorts of anti-Semitism and pogroms and everything. And he takes some clay. What does he do with it, Lynn? It's a golem. He term, turns it into a golem, a, a giant, a uh, starka, right? Who comes along and destroys or, or damages all of, the, of, of Israel's enemies, all of the Jewish community's enemies, right? So that's an example of not the kind of Kabbalah that I'm talking about, right, which I would call perhaps classic Kabbalah, but the sort of Kabbalah that comes along with the mystics um, and where they begin to, I mean, I'm sorry, with the, the Hasidim, where they start to try to take the Kabbalistic principles and use it to fix things, right? Use it to fix things. But it's not really a science of fixing things. That's where they get, by the way, the red ribbon. Just so you know, the red ribbon has nothing at all to do with Kabbalah. There's one text that they know is a bogus text, which ties it together a little bit. It was much too long for us to do here and not worth it because it's not, a, it's not a, really an a, a authentic text. Um, but basically, does anyone know what the, where the ribbon comes from, what it's really all about? It had nothing to do with Kabbalah. It's the, um, it's the story about um, she had many, many children. Yes. So, so it, it has to do with the story of Lilith. Uh, we don't really have time for this, but another midrash is that there were two. There are two stories in the book of creation uh, about the, the creation of women of Eve, and one theory, one midrash to explain it was that there were two women. The first one was called Lilith. Lilith, who was a very positive figure in modern feminist circles, was a demon according to the rabbinic circles of Eastern Europe, and <clears throat> Lilith would um, come and because she was sort of jealous of of Eve, you know, the woman who got to have a family, Lilith would come and do what? Does anyone know? And is this reminding you? Would steal your baby. And for some reason, Lilith does not like the color red. So where the red ribbon comes in, it has nothing at all to do with putting it on your arm uh, for good luck. Nothing. No, I'm sorry. I know you guys bought them in Israel. I'm sorry. But it has nothing to do with that whatsoever. <laughs> It is specifically to stop Lilith from stealing your baby, and that's why you put them on cribs in Eastern Europe, and that's what that's all about. But if you can sell it for $120, then it's a perfectly good idea uh, for the Kabbalah Center of LA. Yeah, the question. Not in Jewish story. We don't Jews don't have vampires. Oh, so right. yeah, yeah, there are there. Yeah, there are no Jew. They just took they just took a, a Jewish character and turned it into a, you know in that in that story. But no, we, we we have lots of crazy stuff. We have the golem, you know. But but no 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 no, no uh, blood sucking uh, bats. No. Uh, Does this have any uh, origin with so, so called evil eye? In the well, yes. Okay. So good. So another Jewish. Uh, it. it it does, but not really the ribbon. So there's another, there's another Jewish superstition in Eastern Europe. A lot of this is Eastern European superstition um, called the evil eye, eye and hurrah, right? And, um, but people misunderstand that as well. We're getting a little bit off topic, but I'll answer because uh, the eye and hurrah is um, something that you call upon yourself when you're too optimistic. So if you were to say that on my... 50, on my uh, 90th birthday. Well, what's the problem with saying that? Because you might catch the attention, yeah. right, of the evil eye, of the eye and hara, or the and and the and that in order to stop that, what do you do when you say that positive, optimistic thing in Eastern Europe? Throw something over your bed. Go ahead, say it loud. <laughs> poo poo poo. You yeah, say right. kuna hara poo poo poo. Yeah, right? Right. Yeah. right? So you say oh, evil eye. Don't. Don't, don't, don't listen to this. This is, uh, no. so I don't want to spend too much time on the Kabbalah Center of LA, but what they do is they package brilliantly by, by the way, I am disgusted by what they've done, but also inspired by the fact that you can rebrand something that is sort of old and tired and, and turn it into something that is sellable, which I think is brilliant, right? So I don't like the fact that they did it the way they did it, but the fact that they did it is really fascinating. 
you know, I, I, this is, I'm really going off topic here, but I'm involved in the, the reforming of the reform movement. And uh, there was, they decided to create a new uh, website to compete really with Chabad, which is doing a fabulous job on, on the internet. They've done, and we've done a, a much better. We are now sort of neck and neck in terms of people uh, getting information from us. Um, but they decided to call the website reformjudaism.org. And I was like, or is it reform.org? Anyway, I'm thinking, okay, you got this chance to rebrand the entire movement, one chance, and you're gonna go with the word reform? I mean, yeah. it, Americans, it sounds like reform school. You know, it doesn't really say anything. You know, Chabad has H, which means fire. They're fire, and we're reform school. It's not a good rebranding. So, you know, it's just an example of why I'm, I'm a little bit disdainful of what the Kabbalah Center did, but on the other hand, I'm thinking, how can we do this? And by the way, if you read the Messenger article that I wrote in the Messenger that should be coming to your doors like today, um, you'll see one of our, our um, attempts to rebrand Judaism in a way that will attract millennials um, and younger under-affiliated under people. Uh, it's, we called it the well. And you'll, you'll let me know what you think, but uh, it's a very exciting idea, and I think it's going to go do, do, very, do very well, if you will. Um, okay, let's move on to a little bit more Kabbalah, though, because we've got a few more truths that we've got to... Uh, so here, if you turn to page three, we've... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I didn't say 8.30, did I? I meant 9.30 we'll be out of here. No, what time is it? Eight. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Sim Sum. T-Z-I-M-T-Z-U-M. Okay. It's onomatopoetic. It's <laughs> right. right? Okay? Um, so I'm a I have to tell you, I'm particularly proud of this particular one. Um, a little bit of insight into my very absurd academic mind. I um, was reading um, Trends in Jewish Mysticism uh, by Gershom Sholem, who really revived Kabbalah for all of us. And in a footnote, in a footnote on page 200 and something or other, there's a, a note about a, uh, it says, it's talking about the crea creation, uh, I'm sorry, about Revelation, about Sinai. And it says, and that is why Menachem Mendel of Rimonov says that, in, that at Sinai, all that was heard was the, si the silent Aleph. That's it. That's the footnote. Nothing else, just that. And I'm thinking, that sounds brilliant, but what does it mean? And I spent, I, can't even, I was writing a book, which, it, which it was, all my books are based on primary texts. My idea is that you shouldn't be studying about Judaism, you should be studying Judaism in the primary text. And so all my books are written that way. And I was, I was desperate to find this midrash of Menachem Mendel of Rimonov, the city of Rimonov, uh, which is sort of pale of settlement in you know, Russia, <coughs> Poland type of, type of area. And um, some of you, again, will be going back there with me uh, very soon and be looking for these little places. And one of them is Rimonov. And, uh, I, I expended every bit of effort. This is really before the internet had taken off. I expended every bit of effort I could. We were, I was in communication with, with libraries in Germany and, and Poland and, and uh, all over the world trying to find this Midrash. Nothing. And it was really going to, it was really going to ruin the whole book because I, I couldn't, I didn't see how I could it was going to be the climax of this, of this book called The God Book, which I wrote. And yet, it was the one text I didn't have in the primary. All I had was a footnote from, <laughs> from Kershom Shalom on page 222. So um, the Weinbergs actually had a, uh, a good friend named, who happened, funny thing, his name, his name happened to be Zohar, which is the Book of Splendor, which is the basic book of, uh, of Jewish mysticism, which hopefully we'll get to. And I, I'm telling him about this problem. He says he's a, he's a graduate student in Jew Jewish studies at the University of Michigan. He says, well, maybe I can help you. I said, Zohar, anything. You want my, my oldest child? Take her. I mean, it's fine. You know, whatever. Anything you do. I, I, and uh, we literally go down into the bowels of the, of the library down in, at the University of Michigan. And he pulls out this text, which was written in Polish, Yiddish, 
Russian acronyms that nobody's ever heard of before. I, I do all my own uh, translations, but this was, this was crazy, Aramaic. And, um, but after about a year of working on it, um, I was able to translate it finally. And I think I was the first one to ever publish it, as far as I know. Um, but it wasn't Menachem Mendel of Rimanov's uh, sermon. It was his student, the Rupschitzer Rebbe. The Rupschitzer Rebbe. And, uh, but but what, the reason we found it was the Rupschitzer Rebbe references, uh, references his teacher, Menachem Mendel, in the Midrash. And I think you'll see when we get to the end of it that not only did I, what, did I hit the jackpot in having at least find some primary text, but because my book was written for teenagers about their own theology, this text was actually better than if I had found the original. Because, I, because this, this uh, Kabbalistic text actually does, it's one of the very few that actually does care about the kind of life you lead. Okay? Set up. Everyone understands where we're going? I just need someone who uh, feels ready to read a little bit for a little bit while. Anyone willing to volunteer? All right, Jerry. So it's uh, Zera Kodesh. This is a, a midrash, a, a Kabbalistic Hasidic midrash, which I, and it's perfectly timed because the festival of Shavuot is coming up here uh, in our calendar, and we're, and this is on the their their uh, interpretation of the festival of Shavuot. So Jerry. I believe. Based on oh, wait, you know what? Actually, this one's so important. Here. We're going to magnify you. Yeah. See if that works. Go ahead. Hey, everybody here? Yeah. No I joke. Jerry, no jokes. Just read. <laughs> it's too guy. No. I believe, based on the teachings of my master, my mentor, and my teacher, Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Rimanov, may his memory be a blessing, who based himself on the biblical verse, God has spoken once, twice have I heard, that power belongs to God that it is possible that we did not hear from the mouth of the Holy One of Blessing anything but the letter Aleph of the word Anochi. Okay, stop there for a second. Now, that is, that is a, obviously a very astonishing thing for a rabbi to say. Because if you're an Orthodox rabbi, this is actually pretty Orthodox, but if you're an Orthodox rabbi, where, what was given at Sinai? No, not the Ten Commandments. That's the movie. If you saw the movie, you saw him come down with the Ten Commandments, right? But if you're an Orthodox rabbi, the entire Torah, so there's Moses, and he's got the entire Torah on his shoulders. And also, if you are an Orthodox rabbi, a Pharisee, you believe it wasn't just the written Torah. What else does he bring down from Sinai? The oral law. So he's got this whole other, what is a Talmud? Like 37 books or something like that? He's got 37 books, right, along with the five books of Moses, on his shoulders coming down from, from, from Sinai. Again, foundational belief of Orthodox Judaism, the entire Torah and the oral law all given at Sinai. However, and it, if you read the text itself, and by the way, this happens twice in the Torah, both in Exodus and Deuteronomy, it says that Moses comes down from the mountain and speaks to the people all the words that God has told them, saying, okay, so this is a, a, a little bit of a test. If the Orthodox are right, or the traditional rabbis are right, and God gave the entire Torah at Sinai, then the Torah in Exodus and Deuteronomy should have said, Moses came down and said all the words, spoke all the words that God had said to him, and the first word that Moses should have said would have been, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Unfortunately for the rabbis, in the text, it doesn't say that. In the text, it says what Gary said. In the text, it says, and God spoke all these words saying, or Moses spoke all these words saying, Anochi Adonai Elohechem. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. Do not, you shall not have any uh, gods before me. You should not kill. You should not murder. You should not commit in this, in adultery. And yada, yada, yada. Ten commandments. For the rabbis, remember, what's the word? This is a huge, almost as big as the creation koshi. This is a huge koshi difficulty. 
because they believe the whole Torah was given, and the Torah itself says only the Ten Commandments. This is especially becomes a problem when the Christians come along, because the Christian monks and, and ministers, uh, not ministers, priests, <coughs> teach that it was only, let's get rid of Moses here, that at Sinai, yes, the Jews had a revelation, but it was only the Ten Commandments. And the rabbis are so infuriated by this diminishment that they actually take the Ten Commandments out of the Siddur. In the Siddurim that we moved out of your seat so you could be comfortable, the Ten Commandments are nowhere. Even though they were originally the, one of the primary texts of the, of the Jewish worship service. So the rabbis are absolutely affronted by this idea that only the Ten Commandments were given a Torah and then the rest of the commandments were written by human beings. So when Menachem Mendel and his student Derupchitzer are saying that it wasn't even, wasn't even the Ten Commandments, right? Now, if you were the much later existentialist philosopher, Martin Buber, you would say, I don't need Ten Commandments. I only need one commandment, the first commandment. I am the Lord your God. If you know God, you understand the commandments. It's what he called an I-thou relationship, right? There's a mutual understanding. You don't have to say a word. You just, there's, there's you, there's the other, there's you, there's God. You know how it is. You can look at your spouse and know exactly what they're thinking without words, which usually is, you're such a schnook, right? I mean, you just know, exa <laughs> you know exactly what she's thinking. Um, no, usually it's a little more positive than that. But um, you, can, you can understand what pe people want, what they think, what they feel without words. And that's what, that's what our existentialist philosopher would say. But... Rimonov and the Rupshitzer are saying something even more radical. Remember, they believe that the letters are important. So they say, forget it. You don't need the, the, the word anochi. Is that right? Yeah, anochi. All you need, all you need for revelation, for understanding, for communication, is the sound of an olive. And what's the sound of an olive, by the way? Silence. No sound. Silence. Sound of silence. This is way before uh, Simon Garfunkel. <laughs> Jerry, keep going. It is known by those who wrote the books of our tradition that, <coughs> excuse me, that the sacred name YHVH yeah, it's is... Yud, it's Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey, so yeah. Yeah. Is hinted at by the letter Aleph, since an Aleph is formed by two Yuds and a Vav in the middle. Okay, hold on. So, remember Gematria, remember you're gonna give, you're gonna give a certain numerical, this is a Kabbalist, you're gonna give numerical value to each letter, forget what the meaning is. So, an Aleph is made up of a Vav and two Yuds. Does everyone see, everyone see the Yuds? And the numerical value of that is equal, keep going. In addition, this form is hinted at in the face of every human oh, being. Oh, I'm sorry. So let me do this. So the Aleph is equal, I can't write it on the board, but is equal to the Tetragrammaton, which is yud heh vav -Hey. So in terms of their numerical value, the yud vav yud equals yud heh vav -Hey. Has everyone got that? So Aleph and God are sort of one and the same. And then Jerry just read the next section, which said, and not, and this is why, in a strange way, if we're going to talk about how to live one's life, in a strange way, I found, even though I never found the, the text I was looking for, I may have found a better one, he goes on to say that the human face is also created on the same architecture, which is a vav and two yuds. Now, my face is more like two yuds and a chaf, right? But uh, most faces are two yuds and above. Okay, keep going, Jerry. The two eyes being examples of the form of two yuds and the nose corresponding to the letter vav so that the whole face is a manifestation of the letter aleph. And this is why it is written, God created human beings in the image of God. 
because in the form of human beings is engraved the form of the letter Aleph that guides us to the sacred name yud heh vav heh as mentioned above. And behold, it is known that this image is the orbiting light around the form of every human being. Okay, let's just stop there for a second. What does the orbiting light around every human being mean? Now it's starting to sound a little bit, a little bit like uh, New Agey there. Doesn't that sound a little bit New Agey, right? What does that sound like? An aura, right? It sounds like what you, in our sort of popular New Age culture is called an aura. Um, I, I, my sister-in-law, sort of sister-in-law, she's my sister's husband's sister. Is that a sister-in-law? Not really, but whatever, sister-in-law once removed, uh, reads auras for a living. That's what she does. You know, she goes and she says, you know, your aura is looking very blue today, Gary, I must say, but you know, and she'll tell you what that means, and so she does. But I'm, because I am who I am, I'm less interested in that particular side of it than I am in the scientific side of it, because remember, one of, the, one of the definitions is that these are the spiritual physics of the universe. So there's another aspect to it that I find fascinating. This Kabbalist, now this is not 500 years ago, it's only two or 300 years ago, but this Kabbalist somehow knew that we are orbiting lights. And in fact, my friends, we are orbiting lights. Whether you believe in auras or not, which is totally up to you, but not necessarily having to do anything with, 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 with physics, right? Jerry, you're shaking your head. What do I mean by that? Electrons. Yeah, we're, we, we are, what we really are is orbiting electrons. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Yeah, well, you know, I don't think Darwin studied Torah, but uh, you know, or, or Talmud, but uh, who knows? I mean, he, it could have been Jewish. We, everyone else who's smart, I know, I, I know, that's not true. That's not true. Um, but no, he wasn't Jewish, and I, I don't know. But but I think it's funny that how we we just because it's religion and science, we just automatically assume that they're diametrically opposed. No, right? Even this even this this Hasidic Kabbalist understood in some way that we are orbiting lights. Yeah, well, the mouth, you know. Hey. It's a silent laugh. Nothing, yeah, nothing's perfect. Yeah, right. the, the mouth isn't giving any advice. OK, so uh, keep going. And we as a holy people are admonished about this to create always in front of us this image in order to know that the impression of God is before us always. OK, and so to, just yeah. real quickly, if we're made but Selim Elohim, what he's saying is we are really made in the image of God, literally made in the image of God. God is in our face. We are structured according to the architecture of God. OK, go. And to equate our own image with the Creator. And this is what our ancestors of blessed memory established as a basic principle in the Torah, that when we merited to stand at Sinai and to hear the sound of the Aleph, then we realized it was revealed to us in the form of the letter Aleph that guides us to the holy name yod heh vav -Hey. And we saw and we understood that this was also the form of our own faces. And it is said, and Moses said to the people, Fear not, for God has come to test you, to see that the fear of God is in your faces, so that you will not go astray. Now, he, he, it's a, that's a little bit far-fetched. He's using the, uh, the Hebrew phrase, um, Yirat Adonai, or the fear of God, which is usually used to scare people. He's using it to say, it's not the fear of God in your faces, it's God in your faces. OK, so he's stretching things a little bit, but keep going. And because a human being who walks always with this thought will not be quick to sin. Now imagine how lucky I got. I'm writing a book for teenagers. And the final line of this Midrash is that if you go around understanding that God is literally in front of you, Right? In the, in the Via Hafta prayer, we say it's for frontlets between thine eyes, right? If literally in your face, what he's saying is you'll be much less likely to sin, to do things that are wrong. And how many of you, when you were little kids, were you were in the bathroom or you're in the basement and you're thinking, you know, and you had this image that God is up there, you know, literally watching what you're doing, right? And you probably were, well, when you go around believing, that you are the God's ambassador, literally, right? I think he might be right. That it might be that you would be less likely to cheat on your taxes or, you know, or steal someone else's 
parking space or, or you know, react in anger when, you're, when your husband gets you uh, upset or whatever the thing would happen to be. That if we literally did walk around thinking, you know, I am built and I am, God is shining through my eyes, that we might live better lives. I tell the story in my book, um, and some of you have heard it perhaps in a sermon, but uh, one of the basic fundamental beliefs that I have is that I, although I understand that culture is relative, right, and that many things that, are, that we consider wrong are perfectly fine in other cultures. You know, I use the example of uh, uh, w women, um, I, we were just in Greece, so I'm using the example of women uh, needing to wear shirts at, at, a, at a beach. You know, or a top at a beach. In some cultures, it's fine. Some cultures, it's not. We could, I, I could give you a long explanation about why I think these taboos happen and so on. But I'm, what I'm not willing to say is that God cares about that. Right? I don't think God gives a darn. Right? But here's the difference, and I think this does come from Kabbalah. I think there is morality built into the very being of the universe. And I, I, I tell the story when I was a kid. I was very young, five years old, six years old maybe. Um, I was going camping with my parents. And of course, I wanted to play with the, the older kids. And they didn't want to play with me. And one day, I'm at, the, uh, I'm at my campsite. And I see the th group of five or six older boys in a circle playing right in front of my campsite. I'm so excited. Hey, guys, Dad, can I play? And uh, they're, they're there with a, uh, uh, and I see that they have a frog in between them in the circle. And they have a pen knife. And suddenly I realized that they have been dropping the penknife into the frog. And the frog is bleeding. And I start yelling, don't do that. You the frog. And the oldest boy picks up the penknife and says, oh, don't worry, Paul. The, uh, the object of the game is not to hit the frog. It's to miss the frog. At which point he lets the penknife go, and the penknife goes through the frog's oh. eye. And I, the way I experience this existentially is at the age of five or six, I knew to the very essence of my being that it wasn't just that America thought it was wrong or my family thought it was wrong or you know, uh, Lakewood, New Jersey thought it was wrong or Jews thought it was wrong. I believe that the very universe was screaming that this was wrong. Right. Absolutely. Right? So to some extent, that's what we're, really, what we're really talking about here, that there is a basic morality built into human beings that if you go around understanding that that's God-given, you really will live. You won't throw, you know, now I, I have to be honest with you. In the same place where we were camping, there was a very good restaurant called the Governor Prance, and it had a buffet, which they don't do anymore. I mean, it had lobster, and I mean, it's unbelievable, all you can eat. It, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, but I, at the age of five, had eaten frog's legs. Oh, no. So it wasn't that I was saying that killing an animal under any circumstance is wrong. What I did know is that torturing an animal was wrong. Now, killing an animal also might be wrong, depending on which you know, culture you have or what your beliefs are. But I knew, as much as a five-year-old boy can know anything, that this was universally wrong. Right. Except we have it going on, And we do it to people. But, um, so the reason I bring that up is uh, that they did a, a, a brilliant study recently. They were trying to figure out whether human beings, are, and this is going to get to your, I'm, I'm glad you said that because it's going to get right back to your thing about, you know, we're, we're killing people in Sudan and uh, um, wherever you're going to say, Baltimore or Texas or whatever, you, wherever you're going to mention. Um, so they did a study to try to figure out whether I was right. I, they didn't really reference me in the study, but to see whether human beings have a basic moral, moral instinct. And uh, what they did, it was a brilliant study. They took uh, babies who were preverbal, who had not been taught a lot you know, in terms of ethics and ethos and so on. And uh, they showed, they, they did um, puppet shows for the babies. And there was clearly someone who was a, ba a bad puppet and a good puppet. One was hurting the other or, or whatever, stealing. And to, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was 95% of the time or 90% of the time. The baby, when offered, and they did it, they didn't use the parents because they thought the parent would. When, when offered both puppets, the baby always chose the moral puppet. Okay? So they, they inferred from this that, that 
that the babies had some sort of basic moral code that was built into their very DNA. However, and this goes to your question or your comment, same study, same technique, same method. They took the baby, they, they showed the baby the, the uh, puppet show, no morality issues at all, just that one puppet had something in common with the child and one puppet was different from the child in some way. It could be something as, as simple as liking peanut butter or wearing a same color shirt or having the same color eyes. And what they found was 90% of the time, the child, when given a free choice, chose the puppet that was similar and rejected the puppet that was different. So although I believe that we are built with a built-in desire to do good, and preference for good, we are also built with xenophobia or, or at least clickism built into our very DNA as well. And that's where you get the situations that you're talking about. So second thing I think you can learn from Kabbalah, at least in my opinion, is that if you, if you walk around feeling God's face, God's light glowing in your face, you, know, you probably will leave a, a, a moral, and I would then argue, more successful life. Comments, arguments, yeah. Yeah, there's no question that um, there seems to be a change in morality in society mm -hmm. where younger people seem to be taught uh, how to defend themselves when they do something wrong and how not to get caught, uh -huh. rather than to say, "This is wrong." There's a thing about the face of God, just to say, "I don't. This is the wrong thing to do." Yeah. You know, I don't want to get into the whole thing with the. But the first thing that happened was defense and quiet, and nobody stood up and said, "We destroyed that thing. We got it." Nobody said that. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 no answer to that, but good, good, good comment. Anything else about the morality issue? Just a, a quick. Yeah, sure. Is it possible that uh, uh, you know we've all heard the old saying about uh, the thief who got caught and got sorry, but uh, stole? He was sorry, but he, he got, got caught. caught. Well, he's not sorry. He stole. He's sorry. He got caught. Yeah. yeah. So let's look at symptom in one other way before we move off of it, because I think it has some interesting, uh, interesting implications for the kind of questions that, that you're clearly interested in. So what is the other thing? So another, uh, I, I want to get to more personal things again. I'll, I will leave time for that. But so we're, we're back up to the philosophical level, which is my fault, but that's the way I, I roll. Um, so. One of, the, one of religion's basic problems is the problem of theodicy. Why do bad things happen to good people? Right. Right? It's, just a, it's just a basic religion problem. Why is it a religious problem? Because most religions, not necessarily Judaism, which we'll discuss, but most religions believe that God is omnipotent, omniscient, and ever-present everywhere. So. So what's the problem? If God is everywhere, all, go all good, the, the Zoroastrians, by the way, decided to solve this problem by saying God is not all good. God is half and half, 50-50, good and evil. Jews rejected that. Okay. So all, so all knowing, all good, all powerful, and present. In other words, so if God is all these things, the obvious question that every religion comes up with is, well, so why did he win the lottery and I'm stuck, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's what you get, right? Um, what I love about Kabbalism and the reason I keep focusing on this issue of truth versus feeling good is that Kabbalism actually solved the problem of theodicy. But it doesn't make us feel good. Why? Because we live in a society where we are taught, women, I, I, you're going to be angry at me after this, and I apologize. But if you loved Oprah, you're going to hate me. So the most common, I've done a study of television, 
And the most common phrase uttered on television, the most common, and it's by a large percentage, is this. <coughs> and after Oprah, by the way, <coughs> it's even more, it's even worse. I'm going to argue that this is the most destructive thing that has happened to American popular culture in the last 20 years. Everything happens for a reason. And by the way, the Kabbalists did not believe this. OK? And here's what I mean. It's not just Oprah. There are a lot of, a lot of, a lot of religious people use this phrase, including whoever wrote and you should, by the way, when you go home, you should pull out your Bible and read the book of Job. Mm -hmm. It's a short story. It will take you five, you know, ten minutes, right? Um, the Bible has, an, the Torah has another problem. When we talk about koshis, one of the koshis that the, problem, the, book of, the Torah has is that in the five books of Moses, it generally appears that if you do good things, good things will happen to you. And if you do bad things, you're going to be punished. The blessing and the curse. Remember that high holidays? Who shall live? Who shall die? Right? But it wasn't long before people realized, eh, it's not working out so well. The book of Job is a long midrash. Remember, what's a midrash? A midrash is a story that comes to correct a problem in the Torah or the Bible. The whole book of Job is a midrash. And what's the koshi? What's the difficulty it's trying to solve? Why do bad things then happen to good people? OK, you with me so far? And what is this? Does anyone remember the book of Job? Does anyone remember what the answer he gives is? OK, so here's God. And here's Satan. By the way, Satan is not with the horns and the tail. Satan is a, a sort of a, a, described in the book as more like a, um, a buddy of God who's a little bit of a provocateur. OK? And there's this guy named Job who is a very, very righteous man. And Satan, the provocateur, comes to God and says, yeah, you're so proud of Job. But of course, how can it be anything but good? You gave him a beautiful wife, you know, like Tom Brady, you know, you uh, before Deflate Gate, you uh, gave you gave him a uh, you know beautiful home, lots of cattle. What does he have to be bad about? And God says, Oh no no, that's I, I know Job, you know that's not that's not why Job is good. Job is just a good guy. And Satan says, Well, let's make a bet on it. Let's play a game. And so what they do is they take away the wife, you know, and then the cattle, the children, etc. And let's see how good Job is. So this version is sort of the next, I would call it the next theotic level, is that life is basically a game of chess. Right? And God, and who are we in this analogy? We're the pawns. And God. You want to knock down a pawn? You want this, you want this uh, pawn to get over here and get kinged, right? So God decides whether we, our child is stricken with cancer, cancer, or whether we smoke every day of our life and end up living to 110 years old. Right. Who shall live? Who shall die? The problem with this idea is that when you start to take it any further, you begin to get into some very, very difficult moral dilemmas, like how do you deal with the Holocaust? So the Kabbalists, in trying to come, I want to, I want to be very clear about this, not in trying to solve, they weren't trying to solve the problem of theodicy. They didn't care what you thought about good and evil. Well, as Kabbalists, they didn't care. They were trying to solve the problem with how the world was created. That was their issue. And yet, amazingly, remember? Religion, science, good answers, truth. Amazingly, they came up with the most brilliant 
answer for theodicy that anyone had ever come up with in, in all the years of religion that had happened in all the years before them. And it goes back to our story of contraction. Sim Remember the word? Simtsum. Suddenly, you have a whole different game. If God was everywhere, God's goodness was everywhere, but God had to contract in order to leave a vacuum, a God vacuum, that we could put the world in, the universe, suddenly, why bad things happen to good people becomes a lot more understandable. God purposely contracted to leave space for us. And in doing so, God left, left space for us, all of us, including our evil inclination, our clickism, our xenophobia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, our greed, et cetera, et cetera. Now, before you get too upset, the story of Tzimtzum has another, uh, uh, there's what we call a nechemta, a happy ending. So according to, and you've all heard this before, according to the Midrash, the story doesn't end there. But we human beings have a healing uh, potential. We can, you know, if you think of there being a big explosion and sparks of God's presence go flying throughout this vacuum that was created, we have the potential, every time we do a mitzvah, to put, we can bring those sparks back together again by doing good deeds and put the vessels back together. That's called tikkun olam, the fixing of the world. And if enough of us do enough mitzvot, we have the potential to bring about a perfect day called the Messianic Age, which, by the way, is what Reform Judaism believes as well. It's not some magical thing that's just going to happen. It's something that human beings have a, have a part in bringing about. So Tzimtzum, to me, is a pretty amazing idea to, to, to base your life on. However, what it doesn't do is make you feel like Daddy God is watching over your every step. I, by the way, I shouldn't say Daddy God, because for the, the Kabbalists, remember this chart I showed you on the front page? Let's just look at it real quick. Daddy God is up here at the top, totally and completely devoid of any contact with human beings, with his children, which is, by the way, the way it was in our family as well. My, you know, I was at work, and my kids were, if they wanted their, you know, their knees, their, their boo-boo kissed, it was by Wendy. The part of God, the sphere, the sphere of God, that is the closest to us, the one that, that, that heals our wounds, that, that kisses our boo-boos, is, is at the very bottom here called Shekhinah. And what's strange about the word Shekhinah is that it happens to be a feminine word. So, so the Kabbalists knew that if you want your boo-boos kissed, you go to mommy. And, and in God terms, they, they, they created this, this system, if you will, to reflect that. Right. Um, okay. Let's do a few texts, because we've, I've been talking a lot. Um, I've been mostly focusing, oh, God, this is a good one, though. Okay, let's just do one more on page two. One more creation text, and then we'll get to, <coughs> we'll get to the uh, Mirkava mystics. I'll do this one for you sort of quick. In the Zohar, remember we talked about the Zohar? The Zohar, which, by the way, wasn't really written by the, by, uh, uh, the author, but let's skip that for now. Um, the Zohar is the Book of Splendor, uh, written in the 13th century, um, probably by Moshe de Leon. Um, it's, he's trying to solve this, uh, another Koshi. And... The problem is um, there's no such word in Hebrew as breishit. Okay, there's no such grammatical form that makes breishit make any sense in Hebrew. Ba means in. Does anyone know what rosh means? Head or beginning. But the question is. What's the eat at the end? So if we were going to say at the head of the year, 
we would say, Barosh Hashana Yikatevun, right? We'd say at the, at, the, at, at the head of the year, such and such will happen. You'll be written into the book of life. So what is Bereshit? It makes no sense. And remember, there's no vowels in the original. The next word is bara. We, 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 we pronounce a bara as if it is a active verb. And then we, the subject is yud heh vav -hey. So in the beginning, yud heh vav -hey created the world. Got it? That's sort of the normal, that's the shot. That's the normal way it's said, but we still have this problem. What is this? What is this? This is going to get very technical. You just have to trust me. There's a uh, grammatical form called smichud parshiot. When you put two gerunds together, two nouns together, you put a taf at the end, which would mean bara isn't a verb at all, but a gerund, a noun. You're looking at me like, what is this guy talking about? But uh, I, my sister's the one that couldn't do grammar. I knew grammar, OK? So here's the thing. <laughs> so all I want you to really understand is that there's a koshi, there's a difficult problem, a grammatical problem built into the very first word of the Torah. So what are the, what are the rabbis going to do with that? What are the mystics going to do? They're going to try to find a drash a, 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 to, to, to explain it. And the way they do it is in the Zohar. They now say there must be a missing noun here. Because this is, this is a form that only works if there are two nouns. OK? You got it? What is the missing? Remember that God that existed before the creation? That Aleph? Remember, you're not supposed to go there? Now, it's Breshit. God created Elohim. In the beginning, this primary God, this Ain't Sof, we call it, the God without ending, this scientific God, if you will, this physical God, created our God, Elohim. And you can see that text. It says, with the beginning, the concealed one who is not known, OK, that's that Aleph, created, that's the verb, Elohim, which they're calling the palace. The palace is called Elohim. So the secret is, remember I told you there's a secret? So for, and I just wanted to give you a sense of this, even though this is not how to live a better life, I, for you to understand what they were really doing, this is a perfect text to understand what the Kabbalists were doing. The secret is, with the beginning, the concealed one, Aleph, the Ein Sof, created our idea of God, which is the God that kisses our boo-boos, but is not the real God. The real God is this much more stellar, if you will, being, emanation. Actually, emanate. being is not good. It makes you think of a, a, like E.T. No, emanation. Are we, have I lost you absolutely completely? No. OK, good. Um, so let's go a little bit to um, what else you can use Kabbalism to make your life better. Hey. So, yeah. They don't. They don't. I'm saying, what I'm saying is the, the story of Job was an earlier and I would say more primitive attempt to try to solve a difficult problem. And in trying to find the truth about the universe, the Kabbalists solved it like this, much more elegantly than the book of Job ever did. So if the book of Job is positing life as a game of chess, right? God, Satan, you're the one. The, book, the Kabbalists posit the universe as a book as a game of backgammon. So what's different about the two? The game of backgammon, what do you do first to determine your roles? 
Roll dice. Who controls the roll of the dice? Nobody. It's what we call random. And the, for, in the Kabbalistic view, there is randomness built into the very nature of the universe because God has created a God vacuum. So the issue for a Kabbalist is not why do bad things happen to good people. The reason bad things happen to good people is because there's a God vacuum. Our job is to bring the pieces back together again by making it a better world. Right? And you are a backgammon player, not a chess player or a pawn. Which means you're going to get some roles that are really, really, really terrible. In high school, I was a great basketball player. I was really good. I was the fastest guy on the team. Right? But I, I went away to camp one summer, came back. The other point guard was six foot two, and I was still five foot six. <laughs> that happened, an honest story. That was the beginning of my wrestling career. <laughs> and I don't believe that God decided, you know what, Yedwab? Eh, basketball is not going to be your sport. I don't believe that. The question isn't how tall I was. The reason I was the, how tall I was because my grandfather was only five feet tall. And I got lucky with five foot six. <laughs> Right? It was genetics. It's random. The issue is not what you, what, 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 what the roles you get, it's how you deal with those roles. And that's where God comes in. So I tell this story all the time. Helen Keller, or I use this analogy, Helen Keller got the worst roles you could possibly imagine. I mean, she couldn't see. She couldn't, uh, <laughs> and yet somehow, with God's help, she was able to live such a blessed life with God in her face that I'm talking about her today at Temple Israel when many of her luckier uh, contemporaries are long forgotten. That's where God comes in. It's how you play the roles, not the roles you get. God did not cause um, uh, uh, cancer right, in Evan Shapiro's 16-year-old body of blessed memory. That did not happen. Science caused ge genetics or Whatever, you know, randomness caused that. The issue is how was this courageous young man and his family able to deal with it in, in the time that they had and it was afforded to them. And there are some roles you can't recover from. You know, if that Chinese satellite comes and, and falls on your head, there's not a lot you can do to, you know, but it's like, it's like wearing seatbelts, right? You could never wear seatbelts for your entire life and be perfectly okay. But if you're going to play the odds in life, the roles, you're going to wear them. And what I'm saying to you is that, that those who play the roles as best they can live them. And, and I'm someone who, who spends my life doing people's eulogies. They live the most blessed lives. It's not the roles you get. I, I spent some time recently with someone who, who um, attempted suicide. And um, th we spent most of our time talking about backgammon. Because if you believe everything happens for a reason, then God did that to you. And he had issues that, you know, I don't want to go into right now, but, right? If you believe that you, there's randomness in the universe and your job is to play the roles the best you can, you can live, you can live a life. And that's why I, I, I call this the Oprahization of America. Oprah has decided that we all believe that everything is predetermined. Religion, true religion, has not decided that. Or at least, let me put it this way, Kabbalism has not decided that. Kabbalism believes there is randomness built into the very nature of the universe, but we do have a moral and a sacred obligation to play those roles the best we can. And by the way, our life will be happier if we do. At least that's my observation after 30 years in this business. People yeah. that are religious live longer, too. Yeah, and there's all sorts of other benefits, and yes, absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> I'm telling you, so let's talk, I don't, I'm never going to get, I should have done this in two sessions, but I really couldn't. So let me, I just want to talk a little bit about truth again. I, I want to go back to the truth issue. This is the most difficult issue for me as a rabbi. Because I often am in the situation of, do I give the person a placebo or do I tell them the truth? I'm, I'm constantly in that situation, right? Religiously. Rabbi. When I die, am I going to get to see my bubby? What do I tell them? So what I tell them is, you have to decide what your theology is before you decide about life after death. Right? 
My theology is that God is the only being in this universe that is what we call ineffable, beyond being broken up into parts. That's why we say, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Achad. Hero Israel, God is unified. So it's hard for me to believe that when I go up to heaven, or to Gan Eden, as we call it, there's going to be little yedwabs with gray hair running around. On the other hand, I think of it as something much bigger, that we are going to return to the, to, you know, you've heard this, you know, what is the, let's go back to Breshit. What's the first image of, by the way, the image of God as king, that image that we, that we saw in the book of Je, uh, um, Job, doesn't exist in the entire Torah. The image of God as king does not exist in the entire Torah. What's the first metaphor for God in the entire Torah? By the way, it's right where, we're, right where we've been studying. Breshit bara Elohim et shemayim et aretz, aretz haita tohu vavohu, and the world was, was un, undifferentiated stuff. And then it says, Baruach Elohim merachefet al panei hamayim. And the wind of God hovered over the face of the earth. So if you think of yourself as having a neshama, a breath of God, by the way, the word neshama, which means soul, translated actually means breath. If you see yourself as having a breath of God within you, and your body returns to earth as it was and recycles through, through the physical cycles that it does, goes into the birds and the trees and other people and so on, then what happens to your soul? If you think of yourself as having a breath of God within you and the body falls away, what happens to the, to the breath? Returns to the wind, naturally. Doesn't take wings, doesn't take little harps, doesn't take St. Peter at a gate. It's just a natural thing that happens to human beings because we have part of us that knows that you shouldn't torture a frog. And that's God. Got it? Now, is that as comforting as I'm going to go see Bubby? It's not. But I think it's the truth. And here you've got to decide whether you believe in truth or comfort. I can, tell only, I can only give the truth in this case as the Kabbalists would give it. You know? But I will say, I, I do believe in people's track record. I'll get a little political. So I, I remember when, do you remember when Robert Bork was, uh, was, um, was going to be, no, but he was nominated for the Supreme Court. And forget about whether you're Republican or, or Democrat, I was unalterably opposed to his nomination. Not because I disagreed with his theory. His theory, by the way, was um, uh, uh, to, to go back to the original uh, intention of the, the founders, which I, I, I'm a stu student of constitutional law. I actually have a lot of sympathy for that particular um, theme. But in his entire career, when every big decision came up that he had to make, he made the wrong decision. The Voting Rights Acts, he, he overturned it. The Civil Rights Act, he overturned it. And my theory is, if you're going to, everyone's going to make mistakes. But I'm going to evaluate your theory based on how well it does on the big issues of life. And I've got to say, the Kabbalists, when it comes to how the world was created, have done pretty well. So I put my, you know, when you say, how do you know it's truth? I can only go by how, how well your theory deals with real life. To me, they do pretty well. Better than tying a red, red ribbon around my, my wrist and hoping that somehow I'm going to get good luck. Right? But yes, everyone has to choose their own truth, for sure. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so um, remember when I said I wasn't going to keep you to, to, uh, to 9 o'clock? I think I lied. Um, so I'm going to skip a little bit. Um, so let me, just, let me just end with my last definition of a Kabbalist, or what the Kabbalists were trying to do, because it comes right out of our discussion right now. Finally, a Kabbalist was trying to die and have his soul go up to heaven to, com to commune with God without the dying part. A Kabbalist was trying to have their soul return to God's presence, as you would when you die, but without dying. And that's why it was considered to be extremely dangerous. And by the way, this is true not only in, um, in Jewish tradition, but in all mystical traditions. In Hinduism, if you go up to, if your soul goes up the ladder, uh, goes up the uh, tunnel to, to God's presence, and you don't have a guru to, to, to guide you down, your soul could be lost. Right? In, um, 
in Judaism, the first Kabbalistic text that we have is in your booklets here. It is. Well, you know what? I don't need to find it. It's, it says in the Talmud that, come on. Here it is. Oh, right. It's the first one. Okay. Page one from Talmud Hagiga. Four great sages went up to the Pardes. Remember, we talked about what Pardes is, the garden? <coughs> they died without the dying part. Benazai gazed and died, so he did die, right? Benzoma went crazy. Alicia Benabuya uprooted the plants, which means he became an apostate. He became a heretic. And Akiva, the great Akiva, only came down whole. And, this is, and, and because of this, this is why Kabbalah was never meant for every day, every, the every day, every person. But I do, th I'm, but I'm going to end with one more piece of advice, even though I just told you you shouldn't give advice. What the Kabbalists were trying to do, if you look at the first page, it says, and we didn't get to, uh, to Mirchavah mysticism. I promise I'll, t I'll teach a course on that at some time. Uh, but you can take this home and take a look at the, uh, the uh, chariot mysticism. It's very fascinating. Um, so in Pirkei Hechalot, the book of, of, of the chariot mystics, coming from the book of Ezekiel, um, they ask, what is it like to know the secrets of the chariot? It is like having a ladder in one's house and being able to just go up and down it at will. By the way, does that image of going up and down a ladder have any biblical? Uh, Jacob. So when I said Jacob was the first mystic, I think he was. Okay? It's like go, being able to go up and down it at will. This is possible for anyone who is purged of idolatry. Then it tells you you have to be a good person and, and so on and so forth. And you have to be, keep all the commandments just like Madonna does. Um, uh, right, I was kidding. Um, so I'm thinking, when I was, when I was you know, climbing up the, the, the hill with my donkey, I was thinking, what other, I felt like I needed a third, a third message from the Kabbalists to give you that you can use every day. And it appeared to me, it realized that one thing that, that all mystical traditions do have in common, there are a lot of differences, is this idea of the breath. Remember, what is a, a neshama? It just means breath. By the way, the other word for uh, a soul is, is nefesh. And nefesh is this part of the body. In Hebrew today, if, you, if, if you're in Israel and you're in trouble, you say you're up to an ad nefesh, up to here. So even that word is associated with breathing. So I thought one of the things that I think I could, I could bring you is that if you want to perform form tzimtzum in your own life and pull back, there's, there's a whole section here which I haven't got to. One way you can do it is to go out into the desert. All of the great things that happen in the Bible happen in the desert. But we can't always run away to the Sinai or to the Arabah, right? as much fun as that is. Right. There is another way to do it. And it is what the mystics did. We don't know exactly how they meditated. We don't know exactly how they did this. We know they, f they focused on Hebrew letters. But we don't know exactly what, because they weren't passing it down to you and me. They were passing it down to very selected uh, rabbinic masters. But I do believe that by spending a little bit of time coming to your breath every day, and getting in touch with that God that's in your face, right? That you can find yourself having the benefits of symptom. And so, in addition to advertising Rabbi Bennett's classes on June 2nd and June 9th in Musar, which are classes about how to live a better life, about, written by people, by the way, that really cared whether you lived a better life or not, unlike the mystics. I would invite you on Friday night, uh, actually the rest, I think it's two more in May, so we have two more. If, if many of you come to services anyway, I, there are a lot of regulars here, come at 7 instead of 7.30. And go to the, uh, go to the, uh, the, uh, the children's library, the Hadari library, and sit with us for 20 minutes and just breathe. And I really do believe that that act of symptom of just pulling away from the world, um, of going into the desert, if you will, will also help you live a better, more meaningful, wholer, more successful life every day as you climb God's mountain and every day as you come back down. Thank you. You've all been wonderful, and I hope you enjoyed our, our two hours.